Good morning to everyone. This morning we're starting a short little sermon series from the book of James. James might just be the most practical book in the Bible, and today what James really centers on is treating everyone the same, treating everyone with love, the same love that Jesus shows to all. And we turn to the order of service, and our opening hymn this morning is All Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Uh, it is number 603 in the Blue Christian Worship Hymnal, and we'll sing stanzas one through three. Please stand. And we confess our sins based on a portion of Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Hide your face from my sins.
Dear Father, as you said to King David, so you say to us, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. You grant us cleansing from all our sins and restore to us the joy of your salvation through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Go now and live in that forgiveness, serve God faithfully, rejoice in that his peace is your peace. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And please be seated. In this well-known portion from the prophet Isaiah, he foretells the prejudice against the Messiah. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I have offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring in charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. We'll join together in the verse of the day. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. And Jesus continues focusing our, our life of sanctification, our life of serving him, and sometimes that involves carrying a cross. That means uh, suffering in some way because you are a child of God. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. This is the word of the Lord. We now confess our Christian faith. I believe in God, our Lord and Father in heaven, who made us the crown of his creation and preserves us with every good thing that we may live before him in peace and joy. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only son from eternity, who became a man for us sinners, who redeemed us from Satan's power with his holy, precious blood, rose from death and made us his own to live with him now and forever. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, 
who draws us to our Savior by the gospel, who keeps us united in the true faith, forgives our sins, and at the end of the world will raise us from death to eternal life. I believe in the triune God. Amen. We now invite our children to come up. Don't sit down, okay? Those of you who are girls, go over here and stand over here. Girls, stand over here. Right up here. Boys, stand over here. Right up here. Girls are better than boys, right? Huh? What do you think? Uh, all right. Now you got to switch around. Those of you who have dark hair, come over here. And those of you who, both boys and girls, bo bo those of you who have light colored hair, come over here. You have dark colored hair. You're kind of. Dark hair over here. Okay. People with light hair are better than people with dark hair. Right? Huh? No? No? Okay, one more. Those of you who wear glasses over here, those of you who don't wear glasses over here. Now, people who wear glasses are better than people who don't wear glasses, right? No, very, very good, and you got the answers right. We're all the same. We don't look the same, right? Some of you are boys, some of you are girls. We have moms and dads. Some of you wear glasses, some of you don't wear glasses. Some of you have light hair, some of you have dark hair, some of us have no hair, but we're all the same, right? Inside, we're all the same. And there is a beautiful passage in the Bible. And it goes like this. It says, it says, um, hey, got to listen to the passage, boys. It says, how great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And so we're different on the outside. We're all different. But... We have something in common. We're all the same on the inside. We're all God's children, and he loves all of us very much. He loves us so much that Jesus died on the cross to take away all of our sins and give us peace. And now he says, as I have loved you, you go and love others. And you love people no matter how they act, no matter how they look, no matter how they talk. You love them. And the reason you love them is because Jesus loves you. That's our lesson for today, so thanks for coming up. And we will continue with hymn 728, This Is My Will.
corporate America, a term that is some sometimes applied to a person is this, to terminate with prejudice. And in layman's terms, to terminate with prejudice means you're fired and there's no chance you're getting rehired. In the late 1960s, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, adopted this term in, in, in their work, in their work throughout America, throughout the world, except in doing so, they also added an adjective. And so their term became to, to terminate with extreme prejudice. And in layman's terms, you know what that means. To terminate with extreme prejudice, it means to kill someone. A famous incident of this came out during the Vietnam War and it is known as the Green Beret Affair. A Vietnamese man by the name of Tai Choyen was an agent for the Green Berets. But he was found to be leaking information to the North Vietnamese and soon after, Choyen went missing on a spy mission. What really happened is this. Three Green Beret officers took him out on a boat to a remote bay in the South China Beach. They shot him twice in the head and they dumped his body in the shark-infested waters. Tai Choyen was terminated with extreme prejudice. He was killed. Does that act of extreme prejudice remind you of anything? It should, because the illustration of that act is the cross in front of our eyes. Jesus' life was terminated in an act of supreme prejudice. But it wasn't an act of war. It was an act of hate. The reason, the underlying reason, why the high priest Caiaphas and the ruling body of the Jews known as the Sanhedrin killed Jesus is because they hated Jesus. Simply put, they hated Jesus. And in the end, isn't that the underlying reason for all prejudice? Prejudice stems from hate, from a lack, an absence of love in one's heart for selected and different kinds of people. If you read the little book of James, you will discover that it was written by someone that we know, James, who was one of Jesus' brothers. Jesus had four half-brothers, two sisters, and James was the oldest of the half-brothers. You ever wonder how you stand with someone you would not have that problem with James. You know exactly, we all know exactly where we stand with James. He is blunt to the point and he has scorching words. He has scorching words for social injustice and cheap grace. And cheap grace is a term that Jesus has been addressing in our string of gospel lessons from Mark. It is a, it is a, a term that really is referred to by Paul, and especially in his book of Romans, and today, James addresses it. James addresses us to let our faith become real and put it into practice. And the way, most of all, that we can put our faith into practice is to love, to love all people. First of all, the principle is stated about prejudice in verses 1 through 4. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. 
Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my seat, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? As believers, James says, we are not to show favoritism. And the word favoritism comes from two Greek words which together mean to receive by face. To make a call about someone or to make a judgment about someone by how they look on the outside. Years ago, years and years ago, I was taking a class on drug and alcohol addiction, and the speaker stopped in mid-sentence, and he looked right at me, and he goes, what is your problem? The reason he asked is because of how I looked. I didn't find any, he thought I was not agreeing with what he was saying and had that expression on my face, but that wasn't at all, at all. Actually, I found him compelling. And when someone is speaking and I find them compelling, I really tend to lock in and I can look a little bit mean as I listen. That was an example of someone reading another person by face by what they saw on the outside, and it was really completely different than what it really was. It's wrong to judge people by face, by how they look, by how they talk, by how they act, and by what they believe. What does James call it? He says it's discrimination. And discrimination is another word for prejudice. There are different ways to define prejudice, but what does it all go back to? It all goes back to being unloving. Prejudice puts a person on a pedestal of pride. It includes ignoring people, making fun of people, being cruel to people, maybe even hurting people simply because they are not like you. And we can be prejudiced against groups like this, race, color, religion, sex, including male and female, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, age, social status, and we could list more and more and more Pride has nothing to do, or prejudice, excuse me, has nothing to do with the target of that group or that person you're prejudiced against. It has nothing to do with what they believe. We'll find that out in a minute. Whether the group is right or wrong, plain and simple, here's why prejudice is wrong. Prejudice is wrong, it's a sin, because it's unloving, and it is so unchristlike. Okay, that's the principle stated. Now, the principle explained and illustrated. First of all, verses 5 through 7. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Here we learn God's pattern in treating people and in choosing the parents of his son, 
we see that pattern, right? Mary and Joseph, very, very poor. In choosing the first people who would hear the birth announcement and see the newborn babe who brings good news of great joy to all people, who were they? They were shepherds. Disgusting to most people on the social status. Jesus' first disciples, fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Who did Jesus reach out to probably more than anyone else? He reached out to the tax collectors, to the prostitutes. He reached out to whom people no one else reached out to in that day. He reached out to women. And he reached out to little children. A church father wrote this about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. A great char characteristic of God is his impartiality. James is not slamming the rich. Rather, he is encouraging Christian love. Christian love being exercised and put into practice to all those around us regardless of anything else. When I did a vacancy in Lubbock, Texas, both Marie and I saw this and were quite moved by it each time we saw it happen. When there was a funeral procession, cars on both sides of the road, even busy, busy roads, pulled over and often turned their lights on. Not just a few of them. Everyone did it. What was it? It was a sign of respect. It was a symbol of love, both for the dead and for the living. Those people who pulled over didn't know anyone about the person who died, the deceased. They didn't know anything about the mourners. But it was a, a way, maybe you'd say a little way, to show respect and love to everyone, no matter who they are, and to empathize with all people. We don't ever, ever judge people by the color of their skin, by whatever it might be. And then we go on to verses 8 through 11. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For everyone who keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. In the state where I grew up, the state of Wisconsin, legislatures are considering passing a law that would go into effect on Wisconsin highways. And for Asians and senior citizens, the speed limit will be 75 miles per hour. And for everyone else, the speed limit will be 65 miles an hour. And the reason they're doing that is so when the Asians and the seniors slow down and everyone else speeds up, they will all be driving at the same speed. It's, yes, it's tongue in cheek. My stereotypes are tongue in cheek. Government laws are the same, aren't they? And they're the same for all people. God's law 
is also the same. God's law is the same for all people. And what is God's law? That we love everyone, regardless of how unlovable they may sometimes act. And the greatest illustration of that is the greatest act of love in the world. The Roman soldiers causing Jesus to die as they unleashed horrific acts of violence and hate against them. And at that same cross, Caiaphas and the religious leaders watching Jesus die in a complete act of callousness. And then what were the first words out of Jesus' mouth directed especially to the soldiers and especially to Caiaphas and the religious leaders? Father, forgive them. And the reason Jesus wanted the Father to forgive them is because he loved them. Love trumped hate, and it always does. In the closing verses, we now see the principle applied and lived, verses 12 and 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The law that defines freedom is defined by Jesus in the Gospel of John, spoken to his disciples on Monday, Thursday, the night before he died for all people. And here's what Jesus told his disciples. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Jesus died for all the people in the world, simply put, because he loves all the people in the world. And as Jesus loves others, we love others, and that's as simple and straightforward as we can put it, How do you show someone love through practical Christianity by following some examples? The first example that I want to share with you, I've shared with you before, because it is the most beautiful conversation maybe in all of Scripture. It was Jesus reaching out to a woman was Jesus reaching out to a Gentile woman. It was Jesus reaching out to a Gentile woman who was living an immoral lifestyle. He didn't let that slip by, but he reached out because he loved her. The disciples were surprised that he did it. They couldn't understand it. But Jesus reached out because he loved her. Second example I want to share with you, the name Dan Cathy. The name probably might not ring a bell, but I'm sure you've probably all eaten at his restaurants. He owns Chick-fil-A. And you know that Dan Cathy is a Christian. That's one of the reasons why his stores are closed on Sundays. And years ago, when it first came out, he was vocally opposed to same-sex marriage. And he fought it. And he made it very, very public. And it caused a great stir between him and the Len leader of the campus pride community. And 
they called campus pride for the gay community to boycott the stores, Chick-fil-A. Rather than get in the war of words, you know what Dan Cathy did? He picked up the phone and he called this man. And the man he called later said he gave absolutely no apologies for what he believed and for what he stated. But he reached out. I could tell he was concerned about me. That's what it's all about. I want to share one other example today. It's with two of our former presidents, George Bush Sr. and Bill Clinton. You may know this, maybe you don't, but George Bush Sr. became to Bill Clinton the father he never had. And when Bill Clinton spoke at George Bush Sr.'s funeral, he told the audience that he loved the man. Why? He befriended me. It's been one of the great joys of my life, my friendship with him. In some ways, President Bush and President Clinton couldn't have been more different. In the most important way, they are the same. They show kindness and humility and respect to everyone. In the country of China, there is something very tall and something very big and something very long that divides the country. And you all know what it is. It is the Great Wall of China. That's what sin does. That's what prejudice does. Sin divides us from God. Prejudice divides us from one another. You know what Jesus did when he died on the cross? He knocked down both walls. He knocked down the wall that divided us from God because of love. He knocked down the wall that divides us from one another, and he did it because of love. Like I told the children, in some ways, we're all different. But in the most important way, we're all the same. We all bleed red. We all need to be loved. Jesus loves us. He loves everyone. And what does Jesus say? My command is this. Love one another as I have loved you. Amen.
Almighty and merciful Father, once again, we realize that your thoughts are not our thoughts and that your ways are not our ways. In your wisdom, you have per uh, permitted uh, a terrible disaster, Hurricane Helene, to cause pain and loss. Keep the hearts of your people from despair as you sustain and comfort them. Direct all efforts to attend the injured, console the bereaved, and protect the helpless. Restore to the hope of all who are afflicted and lead them to praise you for your grace and goodness. We ask this in your son's name and pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we turn to the Lord's Supper, one note on page 10, after the words of institution, the congregation will sing both verses and then the ushers can, be, can begin after we sing the verses to bring people up for the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. In Jesus' body broken and his blood outpoured, lift up your hearts to thank the Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And now the peace of the Lord be with you always.
true body and the true blood. Our Lord and our Savior, strengthen you, keep you in one true faith, and the life of the last night. Live in the peace of the Lord. Christ, Lamb of God, it is good for us to be here. For the gifts you offer at this table, we give you thanks. We come and receive in remembrance of you. We come in weakness and lead with strength. We come with worries and experience your peace. We come with doubts and receive the assurance of your love. In being forgiven, we can forgive. And in receiving your love, we are empowered to love others. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. And we'll remain standing for the closing verse printed in the service folder.